Hello, everybody. Um, on this um, Erev, Erev Pesach, as we're together once again for our daily learnings with our amazing must teachers, back again with us this afternoon or this evening, for those of you in Israel, uh, is Lisa Biton. Lisa was born and raised in Northern California. She holds a BA in Classic Studies and European History from Santa Clara University and an MAT from USC. Lisa studied abroad at Ben Gurion University in Beersheba in 2005 and fell in love with the land of Israel and her Israeli husband. She made Aliyah in 2009 to the southern city of Kiryat Gat. Lisa has worked at MHSI since 2010 as both a general studies teacher and an Israel studies teacher and at both of the Hora Sharon campus and the Eshel Hanasi campus. Lisa and her husband and children live and love living in the Negev. Lisa, thank you so much again for uh, joining us for class and teaching us this afternoon and this evening. Uh, as a reminder, this is a joint program between Jewish National Fund and Alexander Muss High School in Israel as we gather together virtually daily to learn from our amazing AMHSI Muss teachers. Uh, all of our uh, recordings, past and present, will be up on the JNF YouTube website. Uh, you can visit, uh, I believe it's uh, www.jnf.org backslash YouTube, and you'll be able to uh, find all of our back classes and our current classes, and we'll be gathering every day, Monday through Thursday uh, at one o'clock here, uh, except of course for tomorrow and the rest of the week as it is uh, Pesach. And then we'll be back during Chomoy Pesach next Monday and Tuesday, and then take off uh, for the holiday, and then back again through the end of April. I'm just going to ask everybody to take a moment now also to email me at glitkovsky at amhsi.org, just to let us know that you were here so that we can figure out how best to communicate out all of our amazing classes. So without further ado, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Lisa Biton, our AMHSI teacher extraordinaire. Lisa, thank you. Nice. I don't do the PowerPoint anymore. Is that an issue? No, I'm going to put it up right now. Okay, thanks. Okay, hi everybody. Um, last time I was here, I did a talk on Ben Gurion in Washington and leaders, and today's is going to be totally and absolutely different. Um, since we've been stuck inside in Israel now for about three weeks, I thought we'd do a little tour and try to get out, at least virtually, um, and give you a sense of some of the things we do in our classroom uh, and outside the classroom at AMHSI. I know a lot of you are alumni, are teachers, um, but this is one of my favorite tools because it is so unusual and everyone thinks we're nuts for doing it. And so I thought I'd give you a taste of the Tel Aviv bus station um, and what it means to Israeli society and its significance. Um, and so in our kind of our overarching themes for the class, um, we have kind of two major questions we're going to look at on the next slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, don't ask me why they're both number one. Sorry about that. Um, so one, what happens when form fails to meet functions in major buildings? We're going to look at Tel Aviv, which is a massive city. Um, and with urban planning, we need to think about what is necessary, what does the city need, what do the people need, and what happens when a building fails to provide that. And two, um, or one B here, uh, what does it mean to be a modern Jewish democratic state? And we get down to the nitty gritty of what we mean when we say we are modern, we are Jewish, but we're democratic. Are we open to all, are we not? And how do we wanna run a state in the modern day? So those are kind of the two questions we're gonna look at through the eyes of the Tel Aviv bus station. So to start, we're gonna go back a little bit into history and look at the founding and building of the bus station. So here we have uh, two views. On the left, we have Tel Aviv uh, back in the, before the founding of the state when it was orange groves and fields. And on the right, we have the Tel Aviv bus station. You might notice it is a very, very big building. It's very noticeable. It sticks out right in the middle of everything. So how do we go from fields to massive urban planning uh, in a very short I think we lost Lisa. We're going to pause. I think Lisa's uh, internet froze. Lisa, oh, you're back me? with us. We lost you for a second. I'm back. Sorry. Okay. So, guess okay. on the next on the next slide. Um, how do we go? So here we're looking at a map of Tel Aviv. 
um, just to give you a sense of where we're going to be looking at. So we have, if anyone's been to Tel Aviv, Jaffa, Yafo, uh, the old city down at the very south end of, of modern Tel Aviv, um, you know, key tourist point and also the beginning of the founding of Tel Aviv starts down in the south. And then all the way up at the north, we have the Tel Aviv port, which is kind of the cool new place uh, with restaurants and activities and uh, all the hotels kind of line the beach in between those two. Uh, and then of course the Yarkon is that green area up on the top of the map. Um, and the area we're gonna be looking at is, if you see where the line says Rothschild Boulevard, oh sorry, where's the South Tel Aviv, just below the south of Tel Aviv, um, it says Levinsky. And so we're looking right at that chunk right down there where right off of the freeway, kind of above the I and V at the end of Tel Aviv. And so it's called the Central Tel Aviv bus station. You might notice that if we're looking at that point in the map, it is not centered to anything. And that's gonna be important later on. So in the next slide, we're gonna go back to why it gets started there and whose idea was all of this. So, Arie Pilz was an immigrant who uh, moved to Israel and had this great idea. He saw in the 1950s and 60s that Tel Aviv was booming. There was construction going on everywhere, right? The, the country is new, everything's getting built. Tel Aviv is, is you know, a center of life and he wants to be part of the action. So he gets in on some of Tel Aviv's most famous landmarks, the Dizengoff Center, and he is buying up land and he is putting you know, big buildings into ideas. And as we head in the 1960s, this is a time period, if we think about uh, the Six Day War, Israel is on a high, right? We're a new country, but we are strong and powerful and we're this new Jewish nation and we can do anything. Um, and the Tel Aviv municipality is looking for a place to build a bus station that will fit a city. Now this is the 1960s, so buses were really common. They were the main form of transportation for a lot of people. Most people didn't have cars or private cars. Um, the train hadn't been up and running yet. So buses were really important and a central bus station was seen as the way to make Tel Aviv modern and a center of business and for everyone to get out from the outskirts into the city. So Arya Pilts approached the municipality and says, I'm gonna build you a bus station. I'm gonna build you a bus station. I have all these orange groves out in South Tel Aviv. I'm gonna build you a great big bus station. Let me do it. And the municipality thinks it sounds like a pretty good deal for them, right? They come off relatively cheap. Uh, and so Aria Pilz turns to uh, the next slide. Uh, one of the uh, up and coming architects of the time whose name is Ram Carmi. Now, uh, I didn't really tell you about myself, but uh, my parents are both engineers and I grew up in a household. They worked together my whole childhood. Um, and so I grew up in a household where we analyzed buildings when I would like walk into buildings. I'm from San Francisco. So a lot of questions on, hey, look, is this building earthquake safe? And I know it's a lot about architecture. Um, and if you know anything about architecture in Israel, you know that Ram Karmi is perhaps one of the key figures of Israeli architecture. Um, I, you guys can't talk yet, but if anyone wants to uh, chat me in the box or to one of the uh, hosts here, anyone know any of these four buildings here? All of which Ron Carmi designed? Let's see if we can get any kind of response. Should I tell you what cities they're in? Dizengoff Center, somebody guessed? No. Uh, guess. Tel Aviv Airport. Yeah, so the bottom right, that is the uh, the new wing at the airport, which Ron Carmi had a big hand in, Terminal 3. That's good, that's one. Any other? Oh, Yad, Yad, Sara, Yad Sara and the Supreme Court. Good, so the one on the on the top right, that is the Supreme Court. That's uh, in, in Jerusalem. It's, it's known to be one of the uh, uh, best done buildings in, in all of Israel. It's a very famous building. Um, the bottom left, I'm not surprised no one got, that's the El Al building in Tel Aviv. Um, it's famous for its outside external staircase. It was uh, seen as a, a cool feature of architecture. Um, and the top one, if anyone's been to Kibbutz uh, Lohamegat Ot, there is a museum to the Holocaust there that's uh, the Museum to Resistance. And there's a children's section there. Um, and this is actually the children's museum of that building. So these are all, you know, relatively famous buildings in Israel that Ram Karmi built. 
Um, and Ron Carmi grew up in an age where brutalist architecture was, you know, the key. This is, you know, the new image uh, of Israel. If you've ever uh, been, for instance, to Ben Gurion University, uh, is built in a brutalist style. Um, anyone know? I know again, this is hard because you're all typing. But anyone know brutalist architecture? What its key features are? You kind of look at some of these buildings and see they're not all of them are brutalist, but uh, the ones on the left are. I think everybody's Googling it right now. No. Um, somebody wrote cement square forms low to the ground, concrete. Exactly. So a lot of concrete, a lot of square, a lot of harsh, very small windows. Um, and this was uh, ideal in Israel. Partially, they thought because of the heat, they thought it would keep the, uh, the building inside cooler um, because it costs less, because it was easier to upkeep if you're in the desert and you know, there's sand blowing at buildings. Um, so Ram Karmi was very much a brutalist uh, architect, uh, and that's what he designed. So. Um, Arya Piltz approached Ron Carmi and said, I want to build a bus station. And Ron Carmi thought this was a great idea. He was going to build the best bus station in the whole world. This was going to be his dream. Um, and so uh, they sat down to map out what this bus station would look like. And they said, OK, we're going to have two floors and we're going to have uh, you know, a floor where all the buses are going to come in and then a floor of, uh, of stores where we're going to sell things and we're going to make a lot of money by having these stores. Um, and then they sit down and they begin to design it and uh, Piltz realizes that he doesn't have enough money to build what he wants. So he says, at a third floor, at a third floor, second floor, that's going to be more stores and that's how we'll get our money is from these stores. And Arya Piltz had a different idea also when it came to building. He said, you know, most buildings, when you build, you know, uh, um, stores or a mall, you rent out the, the, the stores, right? You know, you, you, they're always rentable and then, you know, you make the money off of the rent. Um, but Arya Piltz said, no, I'm going to sell the stores. It's going to be like condos. They're going to own the stores. It's not going to be my problem anymore. I'm going to make my profit right away. And then, you know, it's not, I'm out. So they begin to design, they have these three floors, um, and then the bus companies, Dan and Egged, uh, come to uh, Piltz and say, look, this is great and all, we are not sharing a floor. We don't want to be on the same level as each other. We want, you know, the Egged floor and the Dan floor. So Ron Carmen says, okay, great, I'll add another floor. So now we're up to four floors of buildings. And by this point, it is 1967, and they begin to build. And again, we're on this great high, right? Things are, are great in Israel. We, we, you know, winning a war. We're expanding. We're a strong country. And Ron Carmi says, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right. We're going to build a bus station that's going to be able to see 2 million people every day. Every day, 2 million people are going to come in and out of this bus station. Um, Anyone know the one little problem with that fact in 1967 or 1970? How many people live in Israel about in 1967, 1970? Any guesses? Googling that also? Somebody said a half a million, we've got three million, we've got one million. Yeah, so all close, about two million people. <laughs> so Ram Carmi built a bus station that was gonna fit everyone in the population of all of Israel every day. That was his, his, his dream, his goal. Um, a little impractical, uh, you might think. And he had another idea. He looked around and said, if I'm going to build a floor on the bottom for Dan, a floor on the top for Egg, and I'm going to build these floors of stores in between, what's the best way to make these stores successful? I'm going to take my inspiration from Vegas. How many of you have been to Vegas? I'm going to just guess some of you have been to Vegas. Uh, if you know, whenever you walk into a casino, there's no windows. Everything's a maze. They want you to get lost in the casino, right? You're not supposed to know what time it is. You're not supposed to know what day it is. If you ever, kids who are here have read Percy Jackson, right? The same thing with the Lotus Casino. Um, you're never supposed to know what day it is. And so Ram Carmi said, when I'm going to build it, they're going to walk into the bus station and you're not going to know what time it is. You're going to get lost on your way to your bus. You're going to go see a movie on the way to the bus. You're going to go, go shopping on the way to the bus. You're going to go and you're going to spend your whole day in the bus station. And this is going to be a center of everything. So they begin to build. Um, by the time they start running out of money, 
things slowed down. It's a lot of concrete to build. Um, and then the Yom Kippur War hits. When the Yom Kippur War hits, we go. Israel goes into a depression. There's no more money to build. There's a halt. Um, the bus station will only be finished in 1993. And by the time that happens, they are so out of money that this original two-story bus station has turned into seven stories above ground and underground layers also. So we have this huge, massive structure uh, by the time it's built. So it opens in 1993. Um, Yitzhak Rabin is there at the opening. Everyone's very excited to see. Um, Anyone guess on these seven floors how many stores are now in this great monstrosity of a building when it opens up on a bus station? How many stores would you imagine would be in a bus station? Ten. We have a guess of ten. Wait, we've got more coming in. Fifty. You're all a little low. Two fifty. Eighty. So as of uh, final count, there are about 1,200 stores in the bus station, which is a lot, way more than you guessed. Um, and so we have this huge, massive structure. There was a movie theater. It was a great building. Everyone was very excited. Um, the problem was when it opened up in 1993, the world had changed. Now, first of all, Ron Carmi built this for 2 million people. By the time we get in the 90s, we have the population to almost fit that. It's the largest bus station in the world, in little tiny Israel, largest bus station in the world, which is very exciting. Um, but even so, can anyone guess why the bus station wasn't as important as it was in 1967, as it was, as it was in 1993, as it was in 1967? right? This was going to be the center hub of Tel Aviv but three big important things. Okay, good, someone told me trains. That's right, the train had been built by then. Uh, there happens to be a train stop, just like a five minute walk. Cars, cars and highways, somebody wrote. Good, cars. By 1993, most Israeli families had at least one car, right? The, which means buses are less important. Israelis still today travel a lot on buses, but it's not nearly what it was uh, in the 60s. So one, good is trains, two is cars. And there's one more big important thing, if anyone remembers that map I showed back at the beginning. Uh, when the bus station was being built in South Tel Aviv, that was the center of Tel Aviv. But now, thank you. So that was center of Tel Aviv. But now by 1990s, Tel Aviv has stretched much farther north. And if anyone in Tel Aviv ever tries to get anywhere, you know the central bus station isn't much of a help in actually getting anywhere in Tel Aviv. Right? You can't get to the beach very easily. You're still about two miles from the beach uh, if you're going to get to the north of Tel Aviv. So uh, it became kind of a not great spot. And very quickly, uh, the bus station began to fail. Uh, so if we go down past uh, the slide we were on, past poor Ron Carmi. Ron Carmi gets a lot of flack for this building. but uh, So here we have some pictures of the bus station today. Um, I was trying to give you a sense of what it looks like. Um, anyone who's ever traveled through uh, the bus station knows that it is a kind of crazy building. Um, it, from outside, you can't even tell how large it is. It's just kind of eaten up by the city. But when you walk in, you have all these different levels of floors and there's no signs that actually tell you anything. A sign will say, you know, uh, uh, platform leaving on floor seven, but there won't actually be any way to tell you how to get to floor seven. In order to get to floor seven, you're going to need to take four separate escalators that don't actually connect because they're all in different areas because he wants you to get lost. Um, all together, just, you know, for size, I'm really terrible at feeling size, but if any of you are really good, um, the total uh, up square, upstairs footage, everything, well, not above ground, but uh, that's not in the basement area um, is about the size of the Met in New York or the, the Macy's department store in New York. Um, we have hundreds of thousands of square, square meters. It's massive. Um, All together, there's 29 escalators, there's 13 elevators, just massive amount of stairs. Um, it's really easy to get lost. Um, and uh, you can just kind of wander, the point is to wander. Um, yeah, a little bit on the seedier side. Um, you move forward a little too fast. We can look at the, the next bit also. Um, this is kind of what it looks like today, a lot of the bus station, because of everything I said before. Um, the movie theater never got off the ground. 
it's a nice idea, I guess, to want to go watch a movie on the way to your bus, but I'm not sure how many people actually think, hey, I'm going to go catch a bus. I'll stop and watch a you know, two-hour movie on the way. Um, so that failed relatively quickly. And the stores, so what they discovered is that they had originally put, as I said, one bus line on the bottom floor and one bus line on the top floor. And the idea was that everyone would wander between the two buses, inner city and out of the city, and then they would stop at all the stores. But the problem was, is that they discovered that the uh, smog from the buses on the bottom floor was actually making the air toxic. So they moved all the buses up to the top floor. But that meant that no one spent time wandering the floors and all the stores began to close. Um, today, it's kind of hard to guess, but uh, probably about 300 of the stores are open. Um, and even those, most of them are failing. Um, it's not, you know, a very popular place to hang out. It's actually considered a very dangerous place to hang out a lot of times, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and the problem was is that all these stores, as I said, had been bought by the people. They weren't owned by R.A. Pilts or by any sort of uh, overarching company. People bought these stores, put their life investment into these stores, uh, and then, you know, are left with nothing. Um, but what I find so interesting about the architecture is that what happens when you have a building like this, which is a huge, massive building that is useless today about, it's not useless, 100,000 people a day pass through the bus station, which is nothing to laugh at. That, that's a large number. Um, but it's built for millions. And so we have a lot of extra space and a lot of, um, you know, empty space. And so what happens in that space is what I find really interesting. So as some examples, if we move on to the next slide, uh, in one of the uh, basement areas, a Yiddish theater and museum has popped up, which has about 40,000 Yiddish books, is trying to uh, bring back the joy and beauty uh, of Yiddish. And you can go, there's, there's shows, and you can go uh, and study or hang out. Um, and this is again, has popped up in kind of this empty space. Uh, another thing that pops, has popped up in the next slide um, is that South Tel Aviv, partially because of the bus station, uh, has turned into a center for uh, illegal immigrants, for migrant workers, for uh, the poor of the poor, for uh, Eritreans and Sudanese and Filipinos, um, people who don't quite fit into Israeli society. And part of that is because of the noise and smog and pollution that the Tel Aviv bus station has thrown up into the air. No one wants to particularly live there. Um, and so these populations have moved in and they found a haven in the bus station itself. The bus station is now home, uh, for instance, to a center that helps uh, African refugees um, find space here or in other countries. Uh, it hosts Filipino churches, it hosts dating sites, it hosts, uh, this is the Filipino market that pops up every Saturday. Um, and it kind of become home to these legal immigrants or these migrant workers, uh, these, these, you know, the people who are kind of at the bottom uh, of society that urban Tel Aviv tends to ignore. And they've made a home here. Um, and so it has become very much a center for them to meet each other and to uh, feel at home. Lisa, a question popped up that asks, when you say popped up, do you mean people are setting up businesses, not paying rent? Are they legal? Are they squatting? What's the situation when you use, um, when, you were, when you talk about pop up? So it's kind of a mix of all of them. Um, some of them are actual stores which have rented space. Um, some of them are literal pop-ups and, and they, they don't have permits or they don't have, uh, you know, any, they, haven't, they don't pay rent or anything. Um, sometimes there, there is a management organization that does run the bus station um, that will shut down things that are, you know, illegal or don't have the right permits. Um, but in a space that big and, you know, uh, it's easy to, to hide. Um, and so they do get shut down, but they do, they are illegal. They are illegal. They're, they kind of run the gamut of, of everything. Um, and, you know, the bus station management has also kind of started to try to figure out how to embrace this space, right? With so much extra and so much uh, see, seen as negative, if they can get even, you know, these, these pop-up markets, legal or not legal, to bring people in and try to change the atmosphere, sometimes they allow it anyways, which I'll talk more about at the end. Um, so it's a little bit of everything. Um, in the next slide, so 
So this uh, is outside the bus station. It's called the Vinsky Park. And we bring our students there. I was, I was texting some of my uh, alumni earlier and they were reminding me, you know, and how they felt, how sketchy it is, how scary it feels. Um, and one of the reasons why I like to bring students here is because, you know, we talk all the time as teachers at HSI about how amazing Israel is and how perfect Israel is and look how modern we are and as a Jewish state, how good we are. Um, but the truth is no country is perfect. And I think it's really important to show people, to show students that, to let them see that Israel has struggles and that if we're gonna be a modern Jewish country, we need to figure out a way to deal with these struggles and not just try to you know, hide them under the rug. Um, and Levinsky Park, uh, as you might be able to see, is known as a center of drug use. It's uh, most of the people here are uh, refugees. Uh, most of them are illegal. Um, and they've been trying to clean it up in, in the last couple of years. There's actually an article about it today um, about what's going on with the lockdown now or with quarantine and the fact that these people here, um, most of them don't have any income now that Israel is on semi lockdown. Most of them don't have ways to get food. Uh, they don't really understand the laws or their rules. And so they're kind of wandering around and they're trying to figure out how to you know, uh, help this population. Um, and so one of the questions that I bring up with my students when we're here is, is what does it mean to be a modern Jewish state? You know, If we look at the people who are in the bus station and the people who are in Levinsky Park in this area, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of my students say, well, why don't we, they're refugees, why don't we make them citizens and allow them in and, uh, you know, help them and give them the same benefits that Israeli citizens get. Um, and that always leads us into discussion of what does it mean to be a Jewish state? We want to be Jewish, right? We want to help the refugees. We want to give people a home. We want to uh, make sure that no one's suffering in the world, that, you know, that, that, uh, that people have a safe place to go. On the other hand, if we start allowing refugees in and give everyone citizenship, what does that mean for the face of the Jewish state, right? If we are no longer a majority, if that, you know, will we still continue to exist? Um, I know that's a big question. I know we're still shut off, but does anyone have a, a thought on this? Should we be uh, giving these refugees citizenship, equality? If we're going to stay a Jewish state, I'm getting responses now. I figured it'd take a while to type. Ask the question, if people ask for clarification, ask the question one more time. So basically my point is that the Tel Aviv bus station and Levinsky Park, which surround it, has become a center for illegal immigrants and migrant workers who aren't citizens of Israel, but who need help, you know, and a lot of my students say, why don't we offer them citizenship? Um, there was an issue a couple years back um, where a uh, child of a Filipino worker was uh, um, sent back to the Philippines because they weren't a citizen, even though they'd grown up here. They were born here, they grew up here. Um, but Israel is not like the U.S., right? In the U.S., when you're born in the U.S., that makes you a citizen. Um, in Israel, that's not the case. In Israel, it's by blood, right? So even if you're born here, it doesn't matter doesn't really matter. Um, and so, you know, these people can be deported even if they're born here and raised here and serve in the army. Um, or people like these in the image who are African refugees who need, who need a safe place and Israel is stuck. Do we want to give them equality and citizenship? Or do we want to say we're a Jewish state and if we give everyone citizenship, then we lose the very nature of our Jewish state. Was that clarification or is that just long-winded? Some way or two. Uh, I have someone here uh, who said, uh, I say it's a case-by-case -case basis. I know Israel got criticism over Syrian refugees from Saudi Arabia, took zero and got no criticism. Right? Anyone over there or just uh... Yeah, people are responding. I got, a, I got a response that says, no, it'll change the nature of the face of, of the Jewish state. So one thing I find about the bus station and this urban planning and, and the effects it has on Israel um, is this very question. You know, we, we've given them no other space uh, of their own. 
that's Israel's, you know, planning. Uh, Tel Aviv came up fast. We wanted it to be a modern center, a center of technology, a center uh, of, of nightlife and, uh, and all the exciting things. Um, and so they've kind of filled in this space that, that we used wrong, right? The empty space of the bus station and surrounding areas. Um, but now Israel's not quite sure what to do about it. Right? How do we? We'll talk about later. Do we destroy the bus station and you know ruin it? Do we do something with them? Uh, here I have a light under the nation, so we should take them in. Is that what that answer is? I got a shrug. <laughs> so Lisa, I've um, we've now officially locked the uh, the room. So okay. um, what I'm going to do is um, allow folks to unmute themselves, but ask that you do it judiciously. Um, so as you ask questions, um, you'll be able to uh, respond to Lisa's questions directly, or you can also raise your hands, um, or you can raise your hands as well. Okay, would anyone like to say something now that we're unlocked? Can't really see, so you'd have to do it. No, okay. Um, so this is one of the things we talk about uh, uh, on this tool, right? Is this very issue of refugees. Um, moving on into the next uh, slide. Maybe. Um, other things that have uh, popped up. Oh. Was that Can you see it, Lisa? Slide? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so as I said before, the uh, Tel Aviv uh, bus station uh, is owned by a management company um, and they've been trying to figure out ways to you know, bring back uh, some life into the bus station to make it cool again, to get a little bit of the fear out of the stigma out of the bus station. Um, and so um, one thing they did is they invited a group of uh, graffiti artists into the bus station to paint the seventh floor. The seventh floor is the floor with all the buses that the buses are actually on. Um, and so they brought in these famous, some of them are famous, a lot of them are very famous, both Israeli and international graffiti artists um, to put up different messages. These images are actually images that uh, some of my uh, students have taken while we've been at the bus station. These are from this last year. Um, and there's also, you know, some in the next uh, image. Um, and it's become kind of a center for art. Here's uh, some other images. Um, you know, I, I'm not a huge graffiti uh, person, but I find them really fascinating. This, you know, self-expression and this, uh, you know, attempt to bring beauty into the walls of, you know, what is a mostly uh, not well-kept up bus station. Um, and what it does do is allow people you know when they're coming up into the bus station it, it they they stop they look around right they experience the the station more than just trying to pass through um a little more of the good and the bads uh, of the current situation the bus station um the bus station has become a uh again it's had this stigma around it um back in 20 10, there was a murder there. There have been a lot of rape cases in the bathrooms there. Um, you know, this is the one area where I tell my students when we go around, um, you know, you're absolutely fine. We're not going to the bathroom alone. We're staying in groups. We make sure to be careful. Um, and they're trying to clean it up, but it is again, a very large space with a lot of empty areas. Um, one of the fascinating, fun things uh, about the empty areas, there are two other things. Um, one is that there's a bomb shelter uh, at the bottom of the bus station. I guess that's not a surprise in Tel Aviv. Um, and it's one of the largest bomb shelters in Israel. It holds about 16,000 people. Um, and it's meant uh, in the case of uh, chemical warfare. It was actually used um, in the Gulf War to, for people. So, so that's down there. Um, and even below that, there was supposed to be an area for another bomb shelter. But even when the construction was happening in the 80s, uh, bats, Egyptian fruit bats, began to move into this nice cave-like area underneath the bus station. Um, and the very bottom floors are now deemed uh, a natural habitat of bats, which means you can't touch the habitat. It is a, a space that the environmentalists have uh, cordoned off. Um, and there are hundreds of thousands of, you know, Egyptian bats that hang out in the bottom, um, which make it, uh, you know, a lot of people say, why don't we just tear down the bus station? This building is 
awkward. It's big. It doesn't fit. You know, one thing that a lot of um, modern urban planners have thought is that instead of having one big central bus station, there should be a lot of little bus stations, not little, but like smaller central ones. Think of how the train works, right? The train has three or four, depending on how you count, major stops in Tel Aviv. So that's how the buses should work, right? There should be three or four major uh, transit centers instead of one big one. Um, but there's a couple problems. One is the bats. We can't destroy the building because it'll destroy the habitat of the bats. So unless we figure out a way to move the bats or give them another habitat or keep the habitat while still destroying the bus station, we can't destroy the bus station. Um, two, and my mother vehemently denies this as an engineer, um, but a lot of engineers say that there is so much concrete in the building that it would just take too much to destroy it. That if you tried to destroy it, it would cover Tel Aviv in ash and dust and whatever for, for weeks. Um, my mother says that's not true. I don't know. Um, she's probably listening to this and laughing at me right now. Um, Either way, even if you were to destroy it, it would take a lot of money, which the municipality doesn't want to give over, which no one really wants to put up with. And you'd have to buy out all the people who own the stores in the bus station, of which today there's about 800 people who still own stores who don't want to sell unless there's a certain price, which means uh, basically the bus station isn't going anywhere and this building will uh, outlive all of us, I think. Um, and so this is why I love this building. I know it's kind of crazy, um, but the fact is that it is a crazy building. And this is what happens when you build a building with a specific idea in mind, this image of a, you know, a great center of industry and, and business. Um, yeah, someone asked here if they've thought of turning into residences. That was actually one of the first ideas was turning it into residences. Um, the problem at the moment is renovating it would take a lot of money. Um, and also the idea of renovating this area, it's not uh, the nicest area at the moment and people don't really wanna live there. Although if you offer them at the right price, you know, it might uh, uh, gentrify the area, uh, which of course leads to other questions as far as, you know, what about the cost of gentrifying versus not? And then also, you know, the, the uh, migrants and people who are there, what would happen to them with gentrification? Um, uh, the issues of urban planning, right? Is that it's not something that happens uh, in a vacuum. Um, and, and I think this is why I love bringing my students here is, is just this question of, of urban Tel Aviv, right? What happens if you're in a big city, San Francisco, New York, right? If you're you know, in London and you're trying to uh, build this great city, this great society, um, which is really expensive, right, in most of these areas, and the average person can't afford them, and they're trying to find places to live, um, and you're trying to build these great buildings that fit your space, and it doesn't, and what do we do next? Um, and so that's why we come to, to show them the bus station of Tel Aviv, even if it makes them feel a little squirmish. Um, the other thing, as I think a lot of these Israelis here can t attest to, um, is that I find most Americans, unless you're from New York, uh, don't ever take public transportation. It's not a thing much in America. Uh, I grew up in San Francisco, and unless you were in the city itself, you never took public transportation. Um, and the fact is that in Israel, a lot of us do. It's a much more common, uh, you know, now it's a little more common for families to have maybe two cars per family. Um, but 10 years ago, one car per family was, was the average. And so people, you know, used buses and still use buses and trains a lot more than we do. And this very aspect of, you know, public transportation and how do you use it in a city? Um, if you've seen Jerusalem and the light rail and Tel Aviv's trying to build a light rail and close down streets and stop smog. Um, if you've been following the news now, it's what's been happening in the world with Corona now that our fog is lifting suddenly all over the world, all the smog is lifting and uh, we can see again, um, maybe public transportation is an important thing and maybe we should be focusing more on things like the central bus station and how to better uh, use public transportation and its buildings rather than, you know, thumbing our noses at them and saying that they are, you know, the poor people's area and that should be it. Lisa, one of the questions yeah. that popped up was how much is the city leading versus the, um, uh, uh, the people leading the changes that are happening, right? Obviously, yeah. there are, you know there are spaces in this in this place that are not safe. There are pop up stores, uh, pop up markets, and things like that. But how much is the city actually leading the changes they're trying to make versus allowing 
you know, the, the, it to just happen around uh, what the people are doing in that space when it's safe. So I honestly believe the municipality gave up on the bus station like the day after it opened. They were kind of, I mean, they'd been uh, putting so much effort and energy and money into this, you know, for 30 years by that point. Um, and it was already, everyone kind of knew it was past due. Um, it's often called the white elephant of Tel Aviv, that it's kind of this, you know, this, this big massive thing that everyone knows is there, but no one really wants to talk about. Um, and so most of what we see is happening on on the individual levels, happening in the community levels, happening at a grassroots level. Um, you know, even the management, uh, you know, the management is really trying, but these are mostly people who, who aren't, uh, you know, part of the big municipality who don't have, you know, a lot of influence on the municipality. Um, and, and I, I, the municipality's pretty much given up on it. And everyone's trying to kind of make the best of that until someone figures out what to do with it, whether it's destroy it or convert it or renovate it or, who knows, something of the sort. But that's part of why it's so interesting, I think, is that it is, it's a grassroots movement for the most part. When the municipalities fail us. Thank you, the person who asked that question said thank you. Okay. Um, some people have uh, been chatting in the box here, I'm afraid to drive in Israel. That's also true. Uh, anyone who's driven in Israel knows that Israeli drivers are very something, aggressive. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it is nice to, to take the bus and the train, um, and, uh, someone else to take y'all three, taking the bus helped with the Hebrew. That is true. Buses are a very fascinating, uh, you know, a microcosm of Israeli society and, uh, you know, all sorts of different people getting from one place to another and who needs to go where. Um, that's really what I had to say. Uh, anyone have any other thoughts about, uh, the bus station, about, uh, the issues, about what happens when form doesn't mean function. Uh, the big argument I always have is whether Ram Carmi, the architect, uh, is good or bad. You know, if he uh, failed society by trying to build this, his, uh, his widow very strongly says that it wasn't his fault, that he built a very nice bus station and then the demands of the municipality and uh, the owner of Arya Pilts of the money made him, made, made him turn it into this great monstrosity of a building. Um, and that it's really not the architect's fault, um, which I don't know. You see his other buildings, a lot of them are brutalist, but not quite like this. Anyone would like to say anything? You can also uh, talk. Everybody should be able to unmute themselves if there are questions. You can um, judiciously uh, click the unmute button and um, feel free to ask a question or comment on. Uh, on the chat. Yeah, this is Michael Feldman in California. Hi, I just found it incredibly uninviting with no natural light or windows. Uh, when I took the bus a couple years ago, I was happy to be there for the shortest amount of time as I could possibly be. Lisa, did you, are you, you there? Half of that. Oh, sorry, there you are. Oh, just, I, I found it incredibly uninviting since there's no natural light and just creepy as can be. I was there two years ago and I was happy to change buses on the outside. <laughs> there's nothing yeah. made me want to go inside. Well, the lack of natural light was Ram Carmi's like dream, right? He thought Crazy. that that would make you lose track of time, which I'm not really sure what anyone would want to lose track of time in a bus station. That seems kind of a, you know, you want to be on time to your bus. Um, but it was on purpose, the lack of light. It is very creepy though. What's the impact of, um, uh, of our, our, our Ozerov station versus using, using the central bus station? So again, that's just what, what, what has taken people away, right? All these new uh, stations, um, there has been a thing in the last, I think, three years, it's gone from about 100,000 people a day to about 80,000 people a day um, because everyone's trying to avoid the central bus station. It's, it's gotten, again, this, this stigma to it uh, that it's unsafe and no one wants to waste time in there if you don't have to. Um, and so less people are, are showing up. Um, and whether this you know, will stay or change, I don't know, right? If people will suddenly start. There has been a thing, um, uh, 
Dana mentioned to me over here also that recently um, there has been uh, a, an interest, a reinterest in this. They've been doing uh, guided tours. If you want to go down and see the bats, if you want to uh, go into the movie theater, they give guided tours now of it. Um, and there is kind of this uh, nostalgic dumpiness that some people, you know, do like to go in, uh, you know, the best cheap, you know, Filipino food and the best uh, t-shirts and I don't know, there's McDonald's there. Um, and so people are kind of slowly trickling back in, but there is a lot to, to overcome. Um, uh, people have been avoiding it because of other stations and also the way the buses have moved is, is, uh, is a change. So we have time for maybe one more question or comment. Anyone else like to say anything? Yeah, people are saying on the side that, you know, it's dumpy, but there's good stores there. <laughs> Everyone Tel Aviv knows as you go to that area to get, uh, you know, real authentic non-kosher food, if that's, you know, your thing. Uh, should I wait? Okay, uh, somebody somebody had a comment, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there there is kind of this question also about, you know, uh, malls anyways today, you know, do people really want, uh, you know, stores to go to? I mean, in our current situation, you know, all the stores are struggling as it is right now anyways. Um, and maybe this kind of building is just past its time. Maybe there isn't any sort of use for it. Um, on the other hand, I think something that a lot of us have maybe realized uh, in this current situation is how much we miss, okay. you know, uh, brick and mortar stores, brick and mortar things, going to places and uh, exploring. And maybe people will want to go back and, and explore after this and uh, get lost a little bit. Um, you know, one of the cool things about the building is just getting lost in it. And that's kind of the point that you find all these cool little things. There's a, I didn't talk about it, but there is a, a drama center that does art that does, uh, you know, live uh, shows on all seven floors. And there's all sorts of crazy uh, things in the back of these uh, bus stations. So that was all I had to say. If anyone else would like to, to say something. Um, if you do come, I do hope you, there is a tour. If anyone's into podcasts, there is a great podcast on this um, by a podcast called 99% Invisible, um, which is uh, just a really cool random podcast. Uh, it's called The White Elephant. Um, Israel Story also did one on it. So, you know, you can look these things up. Uh, yeah, that is true. The idea of getting lost is appealing, but not if you feel unsafe. Uh, if you do go, take a tour. Not that you'll be unsafe wandering the main halls, but if you want to get lost in the back, if you want to go, you know, see the bats, don't go wandering them there yourself, but take a tour with a guide, with group people, and uh, I recommend you go check it out. Um, I do hope you guys all get to come and, and check out the Tel Aviv bus station one day and explore, you know, the other side of Tel Aviv. And if you have any questions, you are welcome to, uh, to ask or to uh, contact me later. Lisa, before we end, can you just share your email for us? Yes, uh, I'll put it in the box. My email is a b sorry a l b i t o. You cut out. That's l b i t o n at amhsi.org. Lisa, can you say your email one more time? Sorry, you, your internet cut out on us for a second. I think we're having internet problems. So I will say this oh, while- I'm here. Yeah, sorry, Got I'm it. back. Give us your email one more time. I, I wrote it in, oh, I'm sorry. I wrote it in it privately because I was on the wrong thing. That's okay. So it's L-B-I, good. L-B-I-T-O-N at amhsi.org. That should be to everybody now. Amazing. Lisa, thank you so much for a, a great class today um, and showing us the side of a bus station that many of us have been to um, before, but didn't realize all of the intricacies and the things that are happening there. I'm sure many of us have stories of getting lost in the bus station. And now we understand why we got lost in the bus station, that it was not on accident, that it was purposeful by the, uh, by the architect and the planner. Um, as always, uh, Lisa, thank you for your insightful and wonderful storytelling and your teaching. Um, Lisa's uh, a class can be viewed on our JNF YouTube page uh, beginning this afternoon, as well as any of the other classes that have taken uh, uh, have happened previously and any classes uh, moving forward. I invite everybody to join us every day at one o'clock on the same Zoom link. Um, we will end and break for the Pesach holiday, and then we'll pick up during Chomoy Pesach uh, on Monday and Tuesday. 
and then pick up right after Passover holiday the following week through the end of April for now, uh, every day at one o'clock, and we'll most likely go through the end of May, again, learning with our amazing MUST teachers. Um, I want to wish everybody a Chag Kasher V'Sameach, a wonderful and sweet and happy, and most importantly, healthy, healthy, healthy uh, Passover holiday. Thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time. Chag Sameach, everyone. Lisa, you want to hang out for a minute? Lisa, I thought that was great. I mean, I really got lost. I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for others from us. When I was at Moss, I got lost in the bus station. But it was, at least it was great. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, Lisa, I know you're on the schedule one more time, right? Yeah, I got to think of another class. Yes. Okay, just send me, just send me what you got. No worries. Amazing. Mamash Todaraba and a, have a wonderful, uh, sweet, and happy, and God willing, healthy Pesach. You too. See you after. All right. Be well. Bye bye. Bye.